Today, I want to tell the incredible story of clearance, migration, loyalty and bravery of Scots in the late 18th and early 19th century. In particular, two brothers mentioned in this plaque who grew up in this house here. Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then at the bottom left hand side there's a button that you can click to subscribe at any time during this video. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. I'm now about 20 miles north of Creef. Personally, I love this view down to Kenmore and Teamouth Castle in the Glen beneath me. It's certainly a far cry from the battlefields of the American Civil War. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Look, I don't want to get caught up in admin detail to disturb the story. So at the end, make sure to check in the description for details, including uh, this book. Him on one side and me on the other. Now, that's that done. Let me tell you why I brought you here today. In 1822, John Campbell, first Marquess of Bredalbin, had almost half a million acres of Perthshire and Argyll. He was rich. He'd employed an architect, William Atkinson, to design and build a new east wing to the beautiful Taymouth Castle that you'll be able to see just in the distance over my left shoulder. That same year, one of his clan, also called John Campbell, married a local girl, Clementira McLaren, on the 21st of September 1822 in the village of Kenmore, over my right shoulder. Their lives were different. John was from about 16 miles to the east on the other side of Aberfeldy. Now that's not far these days, but back then it was more of a trek. Given that he was an apprentice stonemason, the work in the castle is maybe why he was here and how he met his new wife, Clementina. The late 18th and early 19th century was a much more difficult time for the clansmen of the Marquis than for him. To get to Kenmore, I take this stunning road through Glen Quaich. Now, as you come through Glen Quaich, you can see the remains of cleared settlements all along the shores of Loch Fruchy there, where John Campbell, second Marquess of Bredalbin, emptied the Glen of people. From 1834 to 53, 60 families left Glen Quaich. And let's be honest, you wouldn't want to leave this place unless you had to. It used to be that you only left when the new breed of clan chief came round recruiting troops for the British Army. See, they received a bounty and kudos for raising regiments for Britannia's cause. Crofters toiled in the fields, but the richest harvest for the nobility was young, able-bodied men. And the Campbell nobility made that move from clan leader to landlord early. They supported the Hanoverian side at Culloden with alacrity. The clan chief later harvested men for the crown for the Napoleonic Wars at the start of the 19th century. But by the middle of the 19th century, the population had been so cruelly cleared that there were no young men left. They say that out of 3,500 people on Loch Tayside, only 100 were left. The late father of the Marquis had raised 2,300 men during the last war and 1,600 men were from the Bredalbin estate. Now, 150 couldn't be raised. He tried to raise a fensible regiment from the estate in 1850, but where his father raised 1,500 willing men, the son could only find a hundred, and none of them volunteered. One old botter cried, Put your red coats on the back of the sheep that have replaced the men. Ultimately, the children of John and Clementina Campbell were to be part of the flood of bodies, the flotsam and jetsam from these shores that drifted across the Atlantic. Initially, John and Clementina moved to Kilmadoc just outside Dune, to start a family in 1824. Perhaps John, the stonemason, was working on the repairs being carried out to Dune Castle here at the time. Or perhaps that was just my gratuitous attempt to include the set of Castle Leach for any transatlantic Outlander fans. I guess we'll never know. By the time of the 1841 census, John Campbell was no longer with us. Clementina Campbell was on her own, living in Creef in what is now an outhouse and a garage with six children. But our story just focuses on two, the two youngest boys, James and Sandy. Now times must have been hard for her and the children. It was an environment of potato famine and traditional hand weaving being overtaken by industrial processes. 
loss of traditional industries due to technological change, migrants crossing oceans. Seems a world away from the present day, doesn't it? It was getting more and more difficult to survive. And so, about 1855, like so many others, 20-year-old James Campbell decided to leave his job as a farm labourer near Ochterarda and seek his fortune across the Atlantic. And his younger brother Sandy followed a few years later. James set up in Charleston, a world away from Kenmore here where his parents had met. He worked as a drayman. His younger brother worked in New York as a stonemason like his dad. Now these accidental facts had huge consequences when the new clan chiefs came recruiting. Because within seven years of James' arrival, their choice of towns put them on opposing sides of a war that would be the deadliest in American history. James joined up with a largely Scottish Confederate militia company named the 42nd after the Black Watch, a regiment established and recruited in the next town, in his father's hometown of Aberfeldy. Sandy, however, joined the 79th Highlander Regiment in the Union Army. Now, in June 1862, Sandy's unit was transferred and landed to occupy parts of James Island in preparation for an assault on Charleston, South Carolina. Before the war, his brother James had lived in Charleston. The Confederate forces had prepared their defences and they were well dug in behind a long line of breastworks. This was so that they could stand protected and fire at shoulder height at approaching Union forces. Now, as these Union forces charged, they faced musket balls, they faced grape shot, they were bogged down on both sides by marshy terrain, eh, funneling them into a death trap. The 8th Michigan then the 7th Connecticut and then the 28th Massachusetts were mowed down in Swede. And then came the 79th New York Highlanders and Sandy Campbell. We can probably never imagine the hell that it must have been throwing yourself into the jaws of death to be eaten up by bristling small arms and biting artillery. Sandy, now a colour sergeant, makes it to the parapet of Fort Lamar. He plants the United States flag and he stands there in the face of the enemy musket and cannon, holding the colours as the point of inspiration for his comrades. Miraculously, he survives until the order's given to withdraw. The attack had lasted less than 45 murderous minutes. The Charleston Mercury reported, The foe, it is true, displayed admirable courage. The famous Highland Regiment, the 79th New York, occupied the prominent place in the picture, but their desperate onslaughts were of no avail against the stubborn resolve and lofty valour of our brave boys. Sandy found out from a prisoner captured in a skirmish that one of the Confederacy's brave boys showing stubborn resolve and lofty valour was his own brother James. In the heat of battle, when Confederate resistance began to buckle, James, a Confederate lieutenant by the stage, jumped unarmed onto the parapet, rolled a log down into a mass of attacking Union troops and grabbed one of their muskets and continued fighting. The Charleston Courier later wrote about the two brothers. Alexander Campbell fought gallantly in the late action and displayed a heroism worthy of his regiment and a better cause. Whilst James Campbell was conspicuous and has been honourable mentioned on our side. The Confederate James tried to cross the Union lines asking to visit his Unionist brother, but the Federal troops would neither permit this nor send for Sandy to be brought out for a meeting. He was able to pass a letter under a flag of truce in which he told his brother I was astonished to hear from the prisoners that you were colour bearer of the regiment that assaulted the battery at this point the other day. I was in the breastwork during the whole engagement, doing my best to beat you. But I hope that you and I will never again meet face to face bitter enemies in the battlefield. But if such should be the case, you have but to discharge your duty for your cause. For I can assure you that I will strive to discharge my duty to my country and my cause. And that got me wondering, what is duty? What is patriotism? If patriotism isn't protecting your brother, then what is? What is it that our leaders ask us to do with high-flown rhetoric and call it duty? 
If the Campbell brothers had stayed here by Loch Tay, they may have remained on the same side when recruiting noblemen came calling, telling them that it was their duty to fight and die for his land. They may have bled and coughed and choked a different war. But, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie dulce et decorum is pro patria mori. James went on to manage a plantation and eventually bought land in the Shepo River, South Charleston. Sandy moved to Connecticut and set up business manufacturing artistic monuments. James died in 1907 and in 1909 Alexander followed. As it was, these two brothers survived the war, but many didn't. Do you think they'd want to do it all over again today for the sake of strategic interest, false claims, rhetoric or a statue? Hamiandok is going to be a lama alive. Cheerio, Rastan.